I'm here, I'm paying attention. I'm, I'm just gonna be making lunch and listening to y'all. Anyway, okay. thank you so much for doing this. I'm so grateful. This is such a cool event. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie Jane. Hi, everybody who's just joining us. Welcome. Uh, we're we're going to uh, give it a minute or two to, uh, to let people uh, enter. So thanks. Thanks for being here. Welcome, welcome everybody just, just joining us. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a second here. Nice to see so many faces. How are we looking, Alia? Good. Okay, well, um, let's get started then. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to this edition of We Love Bookstores. My name is Evan Karp. I'm the uh, events manager for Booksmith and the director of Quiet Lightning. We Love Bookstores is a series of virtual events organized by writers and book lovers to benefit Bay Area independent bookstores. We've organized because we need to make sure bookstores are still standing uh, when this pandemic subsides. They're uh, vital community spaces, and we're so very fortunate to have so many wonderful stores in the Bay Area. I know um, that's part of what made the Bay Area such a special place for me, and I don't think that I would uh, honestly want to live here without our Indies. Um, so I'm happy and heartened to see all of the support that we've received for the series. Uh, I think we've done 24 or 25 of these events and we've now raised over $60, $62,000 for Bay Area independent bookstores, which is just incredible. Uh, today's event is to benefit Point Reyes Books, which is a wonderful community bookshop at Point Reyes Station, which is the gateway to Point Reyes National Seashore. It's about an hour Northwest of San Francisco. Browsing at Point Reyes Books is uh, always a delight and you're sure to find many titles there that you might not find elsewhere. It's a special place and, and so deserving of our support. The store is currently open for limited browsing from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And they're always fulfilling online orders at pointreyesbooks.com. Um, that's ptreyesbooks.com. Uh, and today we've raised just about $2,000 for Point Reyes Books. So I just wanna thank you all so much for your support. We have three brilliant writers with us today for what is sure to be a rich conversation. Bay Area Treasures, Rachel Kong and R.O. Kwan are joined by Kathy Park Kong, uh, who's the author of the incredible new essay collection, Minor Feelings, and Asian American Reckoning. Uh, the book came out just at the start of Sheltering Place. Rachel Kong's debut novel, uh, Goodbye Vitamin, won the 2017 California Book Award for First Fiction and was a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist for First Fiction. From 2011 to 2016, she was the managing editor, then executive editor of Lucky Peach Magazine. With Lucky Peach, she also edited a cookbook about eggs called All About Eggs. In 2018, she founded The Ruby, a work and event space for women and non-binary writers and artists in the San Francisco Mission District. Um, so happy to have you here, Rachel. Aura Kwan's nationally best-selling first novel, The Incendiaries, is published by Riverhead and it is being translated into seven languages. Named a best book of the year by over 40 publications, The Incendiaries received the Housatonic Book Award and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard, John Leonard Award for Best First Book and Los Angeles Times First Book Prize. Kwan's writings appear in the New York Times, The Guardian, the Paris Review, NPR, and elsewhere. Born in Seoul, Kwan has lived most of her life in the United States. And hi, Reese, we're very happy to have you here today. Thank you. Um, Kathy Park Hong's book of creative nonfiction, Minor Feelings, was published in spring 2020 by One World Random House in the U.S. and Profile Books in the U.K. She's also the author of the poetry collections Engine Empire, published in 2012 by W.W. W. Norton, Dance Dance Revolution, chosen by Adrian Rich for the Bernard Woman Poets Prize, and Translating Moam. Hong is the recipient of the Wyndham Campbell Prize, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. She's the poetry editor of the New Republic and is a professor at Rutgers Newark University. Um, thank you so much for being here, Kathy. I know that we're all in for a huge treat with these three, so I'm mostly going to stay out of the way, but um, please feel free to ask any questions you might have throughout the event. 
and we will pass them on. There will uh, certainly be time for questions at the end of the program. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. Um, Rachel, Reese, Kathy, um, maybe we can start by talking a little bit about your experiences with independent bookstores. Um, why do you love them? Why are they important to the community? Um, and if you have uh, any um, a direct relationship with Point Reyes Books, maybe, maybe you talk a little bit about that too. Thank you. Um. I guess I, I'm happy to talk first. I, um, like Evan, um, moved to San Francisco in part because of the bookstores. Just there's, you know, it feels like there's a bookstore in every neighborhood. And, um, you know, I think a big part of writing for me involves just reading and running into random stuff on independent bookstore shelves. And, um, you know, so I think being asked to be part of this event was really exciting because, um, you know, I think they, they really need our help and support right now. And um, I was really happy to, in particular, help raise money for Point Raise Books, which is just in this really special part of the world and run by Stephen and Molly, who are just like these Bay Area fixtures and lovers of literature. And um, yeah, I actually just spent my birthday last week in Point Reyes, like going for a hike and then getting oysters and sandwiches. And um, I really love that part of the world and they're doing a special thing over there. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree that um, bookstores are my favorite thing about the Bay Area and our bookstores are, are incredible. Um, and I, I also like Evan, I don't want to live in a city. Um, I don't want to live in a San Francisco that doesn't have, that doesn't have every single one of our bookstores. Um, and so I was, so there's that and Point Reyes um, and Stephen and Molly. Molly and Stephen are um, are such wonderful. They're they're really like pillars of our literary community um, in the Bay Area, and I, I we we loved them when they were when they were in San Francisco at Green Apple, um, and when they and when they left, every, everyone was sad only because they were going to be a little further away. Um, but but other than that, it's been so wonderful to have, to like see them thrive and to see that bookstore thrive. Um, and may it continue to do so. Um, oh, and the other thing about the Bay Area and bookstores is I always tell writers who are new to the Bay Area and want to start making friends, I always, um, I always say like the, the very best thing to do is to start going to, start going to bookstore events, um, hang out, hang out at the, hang out at bookstores and inevitably you'll, you'll start seeing some of the same people, you'll start, um, you'll start making friends and, and it's, and that's yet another sad thing about our, our being sequestered right now. Um. Yeah, so I'm I'm the lone East Coaster here. Uh, so I mean, even though I'm from California, I grew up in LA. I um, I um, I'm actually in New York right now. But of course, um, I will say so. I can't say much about Point Reyes, but I will say just in general about independent bookstores. It's like, you know, part of my DNA as a poet and writer. You know, when I was in my 30s, I grew up. I feel like I grew up as a writer. Uh, I'm thinking of one bookstore in, in um, specifically St. Mark's Bookshop, which, sad, which sadly closed and I'm still like, grieving about it. Um, but it was like, it was just, yeah, it was part of my, it was like just as I was coming of age as a writer, it was these bookstores like St. Mark's were so much a part of it. And, um, and it was because I could go there. I went there all the time, every day. And there was always some weird, um, they had a great poetry selection and esoteric theory books or theater or whatever that I wouldn't be able to find online at all. And I think what's amazing about bookstores is that so much of it is also the curation of books. Um, it's like a good friend telling you, you should read this, you know, which is so different than, um, you know, than online, um, finding books online um, based on some stupid algorithm. And, um, and not, you know, and I think about my neighborhood bookstore and how there were before COVID, there were just events all the time and it just brought people together. And, you know, it's just, it's a heart, you know, it's the heart of bookstores are the heart of the literary community. And we can't, we can't, we have to preserve that. For sure. Thank you. Thank you all for that. 
Mm -hmm. I thought uh, one one good way uh, to to start this conversation um, between the three of y'all would be to um, uh, to to ask you, Kathy, to introduce um, your new book, uh, Minor Feelings, a little bit. Um, I I just I'm I'm so in awe of this book and and just want to congratulate you first on on it and and um, and maybe um, uh, if you could if you could tell us just a little bit about um, what what you mean by minor feelings. Um, if, if you think that would be a, a good way to, to launch us off here. Yeah, sure. Um, Minor Feelings is, a, well, it's a collection of essays that came out in February 2020. And um, it's based on this term that was, I wouldn't say I invented, it's more in conversation with uh, other writers like CNI or, um, you know, other, or, uh, other like ar artists and celebrities who've thought about who kind of enacted these minor feelings like Richard Pryor. Um, but basically it's um, kind of like the shame, um, melancholy, anxiety, uh, you know, paranoia, probably all the feelings that we're feeling now and during the pandemic that one feel uh, that one feels um, when the, the dominant culture is not aligned with uh, a win dominant cult dominant reality, the reality of dominant culture is not aligned with your own reality. So it's often felt by people uh, who are in marginalized communities who are um, it, uh, uh, um, racialized in some way. In my book, I talk about Asian Americans in particular and how our reality is constantly um, gaslit by the larger culture. And that involves, um, and because your reality is not acknowledged, uh, you often fall, feel these shame or melancholy and so forth. And it's also just, uh, I'm, you know, it's sort of, um, I talk about literature and it's like, it, these feelings are not felt as much in major and a lot of best-selling novels or um, films, uh, Hollywood films and so forth, because it's more about how uh, it's, you're kind of kept in place by um, economic and um, racial in inequity rather than being able to rise above it, which has sort of always been the American narrative is that you could rise above it. So um, it sounds depressing, but I also talk about the need to kind of be radicalized. And, um, and this is in particular for Asian Americans to be, uh, and to kind of uh, participate and be public and to be allies. And um, it covers a lot of different subjects. And so that's what m my book, um, I'm, you know, I'm also curious about hearing from, um, you know, I'm also curious hearing from, um, about hearing from Rachel and Reese about um, their, their books and also um, what they're working on now too. Um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, it's weird having a book out during the pandemic and sort of going, going on tour, virtual tour for it, but I'm also just because I'm, you know, indoors a lot, I'm also trying to think of uh, new, new stories, new poems, and I'm asking about how does one begin and how does one write during the pandemic? So. Uh, I want to get to that question absolutely because I also need to know how other people are doing it and sort mm -hmm. of getting inspiration when we're all cooped up um, but I just wanted to I guess kind of start and say that um, I read Minor Feelings um, probably back in March right before this all started and I had like stepped into the public library which still is still closed here. Um, and they have this program called Lucky Day, where you can just get like new titles um, immediately instead of being on the hold list, I guess. And so Minor Feelings was there. I was very excited. I picked it up and read it immediately. And then all of my friends wanted to borrow it. So my public library book has passed from like one friend to another and is now with my friend Aku. But, um, you know, I felt it was just like unlike anything that I had read before, and especially by um, an Asian American writer speaking to 
yeah, these like sort of quote unquote minor experiences that um, are, I mean, not really minor. They're like a major part of um, our existence and, and our existence as writers too, like what we're sort of, um, I don't know, under the impression that we can write about, I guess. And so that, that book has just been so important to me during this time and like, yeah, and just, you know, with the um, murder of George Floyd as well, I think it's just, you know, I, everyone needs to read this book. It's really just, I think, um, really inspiring and, and really important, I think, both for the Asian American community and for everyone, you know, to really, um, you know, just reflect on where we are and, and what we can do to sort of fight racism in this country and, and do better and um, not, not be complicit. So um, that's not really an answer to <laughs> any of Kathy's questions. I'm sort of working on a book right now that, um, not sort of, I am working on a book that I've been working on now for years um, that is still titled New Thing um, on my on my document, but it says new thing December 2016. So I should really change that and I keep meaning to. <laughs> it haunts me every time I look at it. Um, it's, it is really about minor feelings, to be honest. It's about um, an interracial relationship. It's about three generations of an immigrant family. And mm -hmm. sometimes I look at it and I think, is this not a big enough story? Or like, you know, it's a, a lot about just sort of the, um, the little, slights in everyday life and the sort of um, insecurities and sort of maybe some self-loathing that is felt when you sort of grow up in a majority white community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, <clears throat> I'm gonna, um, I agree with absolutely everything that Rachel said about Kathy's book. Um, reading it for me was an, was, was an electrifying experience and um, I only want to I, it didn't, when Kathy, you said that the book sounds depressing and I just want to say for what it's worth that I, I don't, I would never call it depressing and in part because um, there's the, there's something really um, exciting, right? About having things that have not quite been named precisely enough, um, seeing them, seeing them named precisely at last. Um, I think that's, and, and, there, and that in and of itself was such a pleasure um, in that, that I found in reading that book. Um, while also like sometimes it was about like enraging and upsetting things and, and, and sad things, but, but we know, I mean, we already know about the enraging, upsetting, sad things. We feel them in our body. So seeing them named, yeah. real, um, there's real joy in that almost. Um, so there's that. Um, and I, yeah, I've, I've been working on my novel. Um, I, I don't know, I've been working on it for like three-ish years. Um, the, f the first two months of the pandemic, I could not work on it at all, basically. I, was, I would like maybe, I was able to write like a sentence a day. I felt as if that was like the like, the like sad string I was holding on to, to um, get me through the days. Um, but then after those first two months, um, I was able to, I was able to find more of a rhythm. And part of really what helped a lot was, um, was uh, was like forming accountability groups. Um, that's been incredibly helpful, um, and I can I can I'm happy to talk more about that later if people want. Um, but also, let's see. Oh, and what's the book? When what is the book? The book is um, I think actually the, the 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 material of the book and like what I'm interested in the book is is helping me in this time to work on it because um, the book is about two women who are both artists. Um, one's a photographer and one's a dancer, and they are. Um, and they're both, I just became really interested in the question of what women are allowed to want, um, or questions about what women are allowed to want, what we're, um, what we're judged for wanting, or like what kinds of wants and desires are highly suspect. Um, and increasingly, it seems to me that the only kind of woman that one can be without being suspect is one entirely devoted to caretaking. And that, which, which, which is inherently, um, if you're, if your life is about if your life is about caretaking, which is a which is a wonderful thing to do, um, that inherently means that you're you're helping someone else with their wants. It's it's not about it's not actually about your wants. It's about helping someone else with their wants. Um, and then the minute a woman wants something for herself, so if that's um, whether for her body, if it has to do with like sex or food or ambition or um, if one wants to, if one's an artist, um, that's, that's, that's something that has to be defended. 
And I'm just interested in that. Um, and I wanted to see what it would be like to have two women who want a great deal um, in a book, hang out together. Oh, and they fall and they fall in love. So there's that. Um, yeah. And they're very angry. And I'm very angry. So. <laughs> Um, uh, Kathy, do you have, ha have you been able to, um, yeah, what are you working on these days and, and what is it, what is it like trying to like tour with the book um, in the midst well, of It's not now? much of a tour. I'm actually in, um, we have escaped to Vermont and we've been, I've been living in Brooklyn. Um, I've been staying in Brooklyn in this two bedroom apartment with uh, my husband and my daughter. And it was, it's like, I tell people it's less, it's, I'm not even quarantined in an apartment. I feel like I'm quarantined in my bedroom and I'm trying to like get work done on my bed. I do everything on my bed when it comes to non, if we're talking about care, uh, non, um, that we, it has nothing to do with the family. And um, now that I'm here in Vermont, I'm like, I'm able to, think and uh, read. I haven't been able to read. I haven't been able to write anything. And like, I, you know, I basically like with the last few months I've had, uh, it's interesting. It's like how there's a sort of, I wouldn't say it's a stark division, but like during the pandemic, it seems like people are either uh, really lonely or never lonely. And it just, you know, and I am never lonely, which is great, but it also sucks. And, um, you know, because I have no interior life. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to like return to, uh, to come to, to go to Vermont and have some <laughs> return of a, uh, an internal interior life. But I just like both from what you're saying, I just, um, I agree with um, both of you. And I feel like there's a lot of kind of connections, creative connections between us because I also, um, Rage is something I'm never going to let go of. I mean, there's always going to be anger in all of my books. And I've never, actually, I've never felt apologetic about the rage that I felt in my writing. I just, and I think I feel like I've had, because I've had the right friendships and mentors who supported uh, feeling that way. But I think um, to really get at all the little nuances of, of that rage um, has been much harder because of where, you know, we're just so limited to the kinds of emotions that we're allowed, right? As, um, as an Asian American and as, um, you know, and publishing and, and so forth. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm right now, I'm, um, and, you know, um, and, but I just feel like I've never had any of the you know, and what Rachel was talking about with um, growing up in a family and having these sort of um, the minor feelings uh, that I talk about and that you're talking about. Um, I feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot to be mined. I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm just sort of throwing my, um, you know, uh, just fishing right now. And I'm just reading and taking notes. And I want to go back to my sort of weird roots as a poet um, not necessarily like write poetry, but try to write uh, prose that goes deeper into the kind of um, surreal imagination. But I've also been thinking um, about a really conventional subject, uh, which is um, mothers and motherhood. And I'm like, can I do this in a way that's really strange and fresh and interesting? And so I've been just interviewing. I've just been trying to interview people. I wanted to go abroad and interview people, but I'm trying to do it, but I can't. <laughs> so I've been trying to do it via Zoom and, eh, you know, it's been hit or miss. <laughs> I'm really curious about um, that question that Kathy sort of brought up earlier. Just how is everyone dealing with, I guess, a sort of lack of inputs <laughs> like creative inputs. I think I'm so used to, you know, hanging out with writer friends. Um, mm -hmm. I guess on walks, but I can't like, um, you know, overhear conversations as much. Um, there's just so much less, I think, like discovery and serendipity, at least in, in my life. And I'm wondering how, how you are 
I don't know, hacking that <laughs> if you are or, yeah. Um, so I took a, um, I was thinking a lot of, about that on Saturday in part because I took a class. Um, it was like, you know how a lot of people have been offering um, short classes. Um, so Garth Greenwell, who's a friend was, <clears throat> who's a friend was teaching a class on queer aesthetics um, on Saturday. And so I took that class and I like, he just, it was this like garden of delights. It was like a garden of like, just like things like movies, um, mo short movie clips, music clips and um, visual art and poetry that Garth, um, that Garth is interested in and that codes as queer in some way or another. And there were like four or five different things that he brought up where I was like, ah! and it was really helping me with my work. Um, and it was like sparking ideas. And I just, I felt it genuine, like there was a part of me that had actually, I, I, it had gone dead, Rachel. Um, and I hadn't fully realized that it had gone dead. The part of me that like, that needs, you know, like I, I know everyone, we all know that like books are made out of other books, um, but books are made out of books, but it's, it's also made out of other art. And like not, not, having, not having that um, has been really, has I think been really, really hurting my ability to work. Um, also my ability to be a human and, um, and get through the day. And so, and so I think I'm going, um, that showed me that, I mean, I've, I've been really enjoying events in a way that I think more so than um, even in some ways than before the pandemic. Um, but that just showed me that, I, that like, well, you know, like there is a glut of, um, of people teaching things and talking about things and so many conversations. And I'm just gonna make that more of a, much more of a, much more of a priority. Mm -hmm. I have to say, like, I have been, um, I miss that, though. I miss that kind of IRL stimulus that happens when you, like, for me, like, I get a lot of inspiration from um, just, well, walking around, having random conversations with people will spark an idea, and, or it spark, will spark an idea, and also I get, like, a lot of inspiration from, like, going to a museum or going to galleries or going to see, like going to actually see something, to see something with your body uh, versus seeing something just with your eyes when you're doing, um, um, you know, when we're doing Zoom. And um, I have to say, it's been, it's, it's been hard, but I'm at, I'm in, I'm in such like the infancy stage of writing, you know, like it takes me such a long time to figure out um, uh, the form and what's going to go into the form and how I'm going to fill that form and it takes a lot of failures and accidents and so forth and I feel like I'm just so in the beginning that I can't um, it, I can't even start but it's like to fill that container it involves a lot of wandering and um, having conversations and reading, of course, you know, that has helped having finally the time to read. And I'm curious what all of uh, your re reading too. I haven't really done as many Zoom events and um, maybe I need to do that. I think that's a great, that's a great idea. Um, um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, how, how, do you feel that you're, um, since as you've been writing, it's been like, if your project has warped and wended at all because of what's been happening right now? It feels a little claustrophobic. I don't know. I feel, you know, I am just trying to pull stuff out of myself mm -hmm. and it's getting a little boring <laughs> to me. Mm -hmm. And um, at the at the beginning of the lockdown, um, research and I are in one of these accountability groups. And I remember just trying to, get anything down at all and then just deciding maybe I should try to write um, this 9-11 scene that I knew had to happen and just like writing about um, a traumatic thing was a way to like just um, mm -hmm. at least you know try to make sense of what I was feeling all the confusion and stuff mm -hmm. um, but yeah lately I I don't quite know how to fix this because I, I do feel um, just that you know my world has become so small and I have these routines which are keeping me sane but also maybe limiting my imagining mm -hmm. but, um, but something that's been helping actually that relates to your question of what are we reading um, I've been trying um, since the lockdown to just read like one short story a day mm -hmm. it's been magical because you know, there's an endless supply of short stories. I mean, we live in a pretty lucky time, I guess, to be, be going through this while we have like access to every possible streaming service and, you know, 
digital libraries and stuff. So um, that has been really just nourishing and, you know, I think invigorating to, to read other people's prose and in like a sort of short, like a small dose that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that, so that's been one helpful thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, with the reading, I, um, I, 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 I don't think, I didn't talk about this at all. Um, on on like social media really because it was stressing me out so much um for the first like three and some months of the pandemic i couldn't read um i couldn't read novels and i just was like and i i had that has never happened to me in my entire life um and so many of my friends were feeling the same way so many writer friends um but it was it was so confusing and and awful because i just was like well if i'm if i can never read a novel again then i certainly have no business um writing novels like that's not i can't i can't write novels if i can't read novels um but i was a godsend during that time and a godsend now and a godsend in general was um i could read poetry um and so that was i was really sort of like clinging to poetry now and i and like often in a given day um often that meant i could only read like one poem that was all i could manage but like that was a lot you know there's there's like there's a world in a poem um so that was that was incredible and in the past few weeks thank god um thank god thank god um i've been able to read again um and that's and one of the books i've been able to read is this one um luster by raven lilani it has this very shiny cover um it's coming out in just a bit um it's really interesting and it's um the language is really exciting and it's um and it's full of sex um and oh speaking of speaking of sex um that uh that's been one one tiny 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 and not worth it for the rest of it obviously but one thing that's been really helping me with working um during the past uh during this pandemic has been um so so my book right now the novel i'm working on it, it is full of sex um which terrifies me on a level that i don't think i understood um until i was too far into it for for anything to be done um I just I'm like a, I'm like I'm like quite a private person um despite all the time I spend on social media um and I just was like it's it's full of sex and the and the narrative is an Asian woman everyone's gonna think every single word of this is about me um I'm, I'm just gonna this is this is gonna be it's gonna I can't handle this um and so like I was having panic attacks about this while I was working on it um and then you know what the pandemic hit um and I am suddenly um in a in a way that I find to be very helpful um less afraid of what it means to be writing a book that has sex in it and it's fiction whatever man like it's fine um and and more far more afraid of other things so yeah I thought you were going to say what has helped is I've been having a lot of sex. <laughs> Help inspire me right about sex. Um, yeah, I, no, I, I'm wondering, I, I have, I think that's my one um, huge weakness is I have a really hard time. I don't know how to write about sex. So I'm curious about um, your, your process actually because um i think maybe when i was like working on my first book of poems when i was in my early 20s i did it, it was the same i think it was the same impulse it was like well i've always been scared of writing about sex or my sexuality uh, and so i kind of jumped and then i did it you know i was sort of uh wrote towards that discomfort I'm like well it was a way to kind of challenge myself but ever since then it's like I just can't do it I tried there was one time where I tried to write a sex scene and I showed it to a friend and he was like you no, this isn't happening he's like you just you. but um I'm uh, yeah I don't I, I'm I want to hear more about that and I'm also just because I'm just so in the early stages I'm also just wondering about both of you like how how did the seed of your book start like where did you get your like you know your like for instance Reese, you're talking about to uh, an artist and a photographer who um are want to be selfishly creative or that's using societal terms of course and um you know and i wrote wrote about my own friendships with um artists in my book and it's very important to me i think it's so important to document um the creative process between female friends and um but i was wondering what what kind of inspired you to devote a book to that um let's 
see. I don't, let's see, I think the first part of it really was um, what I mentioned about that question of like what women are, are, are encouraged to want versus, um, versus, versus often discouraged from and shamed for wanting. Um, that, that, that central question was really interesting to me. Um, I think I, I think I, I really wanted to see on a page um, in, a, in, in, in a novel, um, someone, a woman who, I just wanted to play with someone who wants as much as I do. Um, and, and I didn't want to mute that for, for once because I feel as though my, my, at least my experience of being a woman in the world um, often involves muting, um, muting myself and trying to make myself take up less space be easier for people to handle, um, look out for other people's feelings. Like this is such like a part of how I engage with the world. And that often means sort of like quieting myself. Um, and I just wanted to, and I wanted to write a book in which, in which a woman isn't quiet at all. Um, and that's been, and that's been, and that's been kind of fun. It's like finally starting to get fun because for, I mean, knock on wood, why did I say that? Um, knock on wood, um, I'm so afraid it'll go away, but I've been working on it for three and some years and this whole time it hasn't been at all fun really because I've been, um, I hate these like early drafting processes, which is what it's felt like. Um, and I think finally it's starting to pick up a little bit of life, knock on wood, please don't, please don't leave me. Um, yeah. And yeah, I know it's been, um, it's been really, Rachel and I, so um, maybe I'll just talk about it a little bit in case this helps people. Um, so Rachel and I have been in an accountability group in which um, we have um, five of us and we're just emailing each, we commit every month and we renew the commitment. Um, and we just email each other um, what we worked on that day. And we have like a stated goal of some kind. So some people have like a time, a number of hours they want to work. Um, some people have a word count and like Obviously, you might not make it every time, um, but that's but that's totally fine. That it's just the idea is to have just like a little bit of like gentle pressure and encouragement. Um, so I have that. That's one accountability group, and then I have a second one in which, with two friends, we're just texting each other about how our writing day went and throwing in like details and pictures and um, and feelings and <laughs> and that's been that's been that's been enormously helpful. I honestly don't think I would be writing at all um, if it weren't for those. Mm -hmm. What about y'all? What anything that you've found to be any any routines that have changed? Any? Um... Yeah, I mean the whole routine. <laughs> um, I well, I'll also add that Reese and I have been trying to learn our respective mother tongues a little bit. So <laughs> Reese yeah. is. To learn more Korean and I'm trying to learn more Chinese. I know hardly any, but we just will text each other. I've really slacked off, but just we'll text each other like some like chicken scratch characters or Reese will say, I've watched this many episodes of a K drama. <laughs> and that mm -hmm. counts as so that has been nice too. I think just creating structure where there is none has been so helpful to me and sometimes even um for me you know like i think just cooking dinner at the end of the day has has helped just like punctuate the day a little bit and give me a sense that um i can do something and it can just like begin and end like i think what's so hard about writing during this time is that like writing itself is totally uncertain and you know has no guarantees and i might just be writing trash and <laughs> there's really no guarantee of that um, and that uncertainty has always sort of existed, I guess, in life. I mean, it is life. Life is uncertain. But I think that in our ordinary lives, we can sort of trick ourselves into thinking that's not the case. You know, we have these places to be and things to do. And, um, and that gives us some semblance of control. And now all bets are off and like, it's very clear that we don't <laughs> know what the future holds and you know we can't really be certain about anything um and that's i think yeah it's it's a struggle but at the same time like that is what the writing process is and i think um it's been a reminder that you know it's never fully up to me and that's also really exciting like it's part inspiration you know and part just um, surprising yourself with what, you know, magical thing appears or doesn't appear, right? Sometimes I'm just sitting there and trying to like 
really just eke out these terrible words and sometimes writing the same sentence over and over again. There's so many moments like that, but there are also like the very, very occasional um, magical moments. And so, um, yeah, with this time I've been, um, like I, I mentioned earlier, I really need routines, I think, um, especially now just to sort of trick myself into feeling that at least I've done something and checked something off a list, even if it, it doesn't actually amount to anything ultimately. Um, so I have a sort of system now where I just pretty much roll out of bed, like, and put on my sweatpants and sit at the computer um, and I'll time myself because that's sort of what is motivating me, just like the sort of, um, I mean, this is a little embarrassing, but I have, <laughs> I guess I can just show people. I have this like, I write on legal pads because they feel trashy and like, you know, the kind of low pressure. Um, but I started doing this thing where I'll draw like little pies with wedges on them and each wedge represents half an hour. And so if I finish half an hour, I'll like color in my wedge. And mm -hmm. that has just been, um, you know, a way to hack my own personality and give myself a little bit delight, a little, a little bit of like delight every day, just that I can like, at least color in this pie. And even if I haven't figured out like how a chapter ends, or even what I'm doing at all, you know, at least I have these colored in pies that, will, that prove that I've done something for the day. So that's my, yeah, my pandemic writing ritual is coloring and just wedges on a pie and sometimes I feel very inspired and I'm like this is going to be an eight wedge day and then other mm -hmm. days I can only manage a few wedges but <laughs> I love that idea of a pie <laughs> that's something to do I think we just um I've been thinking about time 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 a lot because you know I think our whole con the concept of time has changed because of the pandemic I think uh this was uh, something that I read, it's uh, Alice, so like Kim said, where, you know, when I was, especially when I was in New um, Brooklyn, I just felt, everyone was kept saying this over and over. It's not like, it's become like sort of a pandemic cliche where it, like, it would be Friday and I thought, yes, and I just would be shocked that it was Friday because yesterday felt like Friday. It just like time is just slipping through your fingers. And, um, and I think part of it is because we're kind of, we're we're put we're stuck in place, and um, Alice was saying that like, you know, the contours of time, the way we define time is through space. Space, like if we go from one space to another space to another space, that's how we create memories. Memory is time and space, and it's like it's a way of like carving out memory, right? It's a carving out like one slot of of time. Um, uh, of a day and be like, okay, that happened because I was here and then I went there and there. And now um, we're just, we're just here and we're just like on Zoom all the time. And what, what makes, uh, what's very distinct about URL is that it just, it's a com complete collapse of time and space. I'm just, I'm just talking so abstractly. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But anyway, so I was just, so I think uh, actually leaving New York and being in another space made, uh, made me realize like, oh my, that each day feels like there's, there is more of a contour between each day. And I think part of it is because I'm able to go outdoors and so forth. But the uncertainty, I'm like the most impatient person I know, which is just absolutely torturous because uh, for me as a writer, because being a writer takes a lot of patience and and it takes a lot of uncertainty and a lot of waiting. And, um, and I think this is collectively what we're all going through is that there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty and impatience for this to be over. But there's no idea there's, there's going to be like, we have no idea what the future is going to be like, and which is what makes waiting, um, we're just sort of waiting. And that's an assignment that I gave my students um, I was just giving them a lot of, because they were feeling the same thing. Like they were just really, um, just, they felt, you, and this was a few months ago, but they felt even almost guilty for writing poetry, you know, which is even more unmarketable than anything else, like writing poetry and during, um, when there's so much unrest and stuff. And so they, so I was just giving them prompts and one of the prompts was, 
um, waiting. Like what, um, um, like um, each day I want you to write something about waiting because when you're waiting, it just puts you in such this position of powerlessness. You know, it's like when you're, when you're waiting, you're always, you know, whether you're like the, whether it's like unrequited love or you're just waiting at the DMV office or waiting to see what's going to happen with the pandemic or, um, you know, and it's, it's just, it's something that people of less privilege have to do more often is wait, you know, and I was like, well, why don't we sit in that waiting and see what that feels like? Um, Cause I, you know, it's just, it, it's, a lot of times it feels interminable, but I'm like, well, maybe I should just sit in it and also write about waiting as well. Um, the other assignment prompt that I thought has helped and that I've been doing here and there is because has been just very basic. I've been, um, you know, um, this was early on when everyone was sheltering in place and I was like, um, write poems that have something to do with touch, you know, cause that's a sensation that we're all missing, right? Um, and, um, and then I would give sub prompts to touch, you know, okay, animal, it has to have an animal in it, you know, and touch, you know, so um, anyway. Yeah. I feel like poetry is so valuable right now because mm -hmm. that it answers this question of what are we doing here, but it just sort of helps give some shape to the questions that we all have right now. And I think there's I mean, that's kind of a nice thing about writing right now, I think, is for me, I've been able to divorce it a little bit more from like the ego and mm -hmm. from commercial merit of whatever the mm -hmm. thing I'm working on, you know, like I can sort of kind of lightly imagine that um, capitalism will fail and, you know, <laughs> that we won't have to sell books anymore. We can just write them. Um, mm -hmm. That's been a very nice exercise for me because I think sometimes the ego you know is sort of what makes me feel that I can't write something or just gives me more fear mm -hmm. or like makes me worry about reception or worry that I can't write a sex scene which I'm also trying to do and also very terrified of but there are moments you know in the day when I can think like who the fuck cares and mm -hmm. you know, can sort of be separate from this a little bit and let it just exist so that's mm -hmm. been something that I've only kind of managed recently and in this time and so in that way that's felt a little bit like a blessing yeah I do I do say I have this sense of letting go because it's like I don't know how much maybe it will the way books are will be published will be changed like another one of my questions was like more specific than that like do you think the way we tell stories will change mm -hmm. after it the pandemic I mean I think I would hope so because I was really sick especially for like ethnic literature, which I've written about, like I was really sick of the way it was being told. I think both of you tell it in a really, tell your stories in a really uh, unique and vivid way, but there's always been this expectation of how uh, race, uh, stories of race were told that was so boring, it got so boring after a while. And I was like, well, I'm, I, I hope that the way we tell stories will change after the pandemic, but maybe, it will also be more than that. It will also be the way stories are uh, disseminated, the way it will be produced, maybe also the market value. I, I, I have no idea. Maybe it'll, everything will just be the same. I'm, I'm being melodramatic, I don't know. But I do think that um, there are, I hope there are changes um, for all this shit that we're going through. <laughs> yeah. So so we've got some questions coming in from the audience, um, and, and I think uh, this is uh, leads me to maybe the first one. Um, uh, this and, and if you have questions at any point, please feel free to um, type them into Alia. Um, th this first one comes from RJ and is for all all three of you guys. Um, it's uh, could you could you share your ideas and or practice about how you recognize, maybe even nurture your sense of agency as writers and also um, how you make agency and the contestation of agency within, from, around a minority subject visible in your work uh, for, their for your character's subjects and for yourselves. Uh, I think um, RO is addressing this via the ide idea of femme and queer desires, but I I'm wondering how your practice of writing and the work on the page might be vehicles to claiming agency in subjecthood. I'm interested in how minority writers, I am non-binary, femme, and queer, 
deal with how aesthetic commitments in your work give you a way of countering white supremacy as a practice and work? Um, I, I, have, I have a thought about that. Um, and it's something I think about a lot. Um, it's the question of, um, of who I allow to live in my head when I'm working. Um, and, uh, and by that I mean, um, because you know, a very common question that's asked of writers is um, who, are you, who are you writing for? Like what audience do you have in mind? Um, and for me, that, that, that used to be, I used to think that, was a, I, that my answer to it was really boring because my answer was always, um, I write for myself. Um, I just, I, it's like, I find, the, I find writing to be so absorbing that it, when I'm writing, I can only please myself. Um, it is actually impossible for me to have anyone else in there. Um, and I used to think that was boring. And I realized um, eventually at some point that if, if that's the case, if, if I'm writing with me as an audience, um, that, that actually does have um, quite, um, quite significant for my work, um, political um, implications, because then I'm centering as a, as a reader, um, a Korean American immigrant, um, queer woman um and that is not a body that has been centered very often in american letters like it's been centered like 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 four times you know like <laughs> like, like you can be like help it can it on our hands um and and so that's really exciting to me um in terms of how i think about um what what what, what audience can be um and maybe a reverse way of saying that is um is uh is somebody wants, um, especially with nonfiction, right? Um, especially with the kind of nonfiction, at least that that I write and that I know Rachel um, and Rachel and Kathy also very much write. Um, so if I write about, if I write a nonfiction piece, um, as I often do, um, that has anything to do with race or um, gender or sexuality or um, God forbid, like all of the above, um, it's just hate mail will come, right? Like hate, I, then I'm a woman on the internet with an opinion. Um, no matter what I do, hate mail will arrive. Um, and by hate mail, I mean, sometimes it's chill, you know, like it's like, it's just like, I hate your opinions, but sometimes it really is like death threats and rape threats um, and which sucks. Um, but I realized like, okay, if, if, I'm in, if I'm never gonna be able to write, write on something along these lines that um, I'm always gonna piss someone off. And so a question that is, uh, that is always um, central to me when I'm writing nonfiction um, and making any kind of argument um, is who am I willing to piss off? Like who is, who is the audience who I can piss off and I will still know that I have written what I wanted to write. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I, th I, think, I feel also thinking about audience is a, um, is a way in which I, I it, it helps me feel um, just a little bit more powerful when I'm working. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I guess like usually that comes to audience, right? Um, I think that if I, when I'm writing something and I'm pissing off the right people that I'm doing I'm going in the right direction. So that's, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm like, if I'm, you know, but of course hate mail can get scary and it is, uh, it is, it, it is very definitely destabilizing to that, get that kind of hate mail. Um, you know, it's, I would say, I don't know. I think it depends on the genre that I'm working on. I think um, nonfiction was the first, when I was working on nonfiction, that was, actually when I uh the first time that I was actually seriously having a conversation with an audience I think normally especially when I write poetry I do just more think write for myself but I what I was you know when you're writing nonfiction, you're making um the um an argument the journey is the argument itself you know it's 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 I'm, I'm working with rhetoric which is quite different from um um poetry and I, it was the first time where I was like, I am writing for, um, you know, I was thinking it helped for me to, of course, it was like, of course, center Asian bodies, Asian American female bodies, but also by centering it, I was thinking um, not just, okay, I'm writing for an Asian American audience. I was thinking specific people, like I'm writing for my best friend. I'm writing for my daughter when she's going to be, 22 and we'll be reading this i'm writing for my students um i'm writing for this one woman who i met who was like crying in my um arms about how lonely she felt and and so forth so i was actually thinking about it was almost like i was like this book was a conversation with these people and it was really important that i was um 
writing to them. And with um, poetry, I've uh, I always had this ethos where I was like, I'm never explaining my poetry to someone else. I didn't want to ever explain. And by explaining, I didn't, I was never interested in explaining what a metaphor meant or what this Korean word in my poem meant or anything. Either you figured it out or not. It was like almost like a political gesture where I refused to explain my poetry. Maybe people thought it was pretentious whatever fuck you that's what I thought but I think with nonfiction, it was different like I thought yes I do have to explain myself but I was explaining myself not to a white white the difference was I was not explaining myself not to a white audience but I was explaining myself to an Asian audience I was explaining myself to myself because I never allowed myself to do that you know and it was by explaining myself I was like thinking aloud and um, I think this is a very uh a fraught time for everyone who, uh, uh, for all BIPOC, but I think for Asian Americans, they're in, they're kind of in this limbo where, uh, which I write about in my book, where we're both victims and perpetrators. Um, and in my book, it was really important though to recognize the hurt that is never recognized um, um, in among Asian Americans, the systemic hurt. Um, and also, what to do about that hurt. So there was that argu um, uh, argument I was trying to make where if we're talking about countering supremacy is to kind of understand, recognize that we have rich contradictions inside us and then to, and then, um, what, and then to talk about or open up the question of what we're gonna do about that. Um, I think when we're talking, using words like agency and white supremacy, um, I think, it's so different, like writing is so different from like say social media, you know, where you really have to allow your characters to have contradictions inside them and um, allow them to have these ugly conflicted feelings. And I think that's where a lot of the agency comes, comes in. And that's countering kind of white supremacy. You know, when we want, um, I think when we say, like I say in my book, like, uh, we always want my um, people of color, people of color characters, characters of color to be good, right? To be good. Um, there's this white expectation of that. But I think it's also that expectation is coming from our own community too, where we want characters of color to be good. That they always have to say the right things and do the right things and not offend in any kind of way, which I'm sorry, it makes for very boring literature. We have a lot of ugly contradictory feelings and we have to allow that to happen. And I think that is one way of really showing um, ourselves and also ourselves and also a way of countering um, white supremacy, but it's not gonna happen through any kind of virtue signaling. I 100% agree with that. And I think just, you know, like, in just writing characters who are fully human and aren't just, you know, sort of these two dimensional vehicles for empathy that I think, you know, Kathy sort of alluded to, to earlier that has resulted in a lot of boring fiction, um, like sort of tailored to a more white audience, I think, you know, that that is important and that and that does something. Um, I think with this question, I I guess I just feel like um, this sort of relates to Kathy's book, but I think, you know, Asian Americans, we are, a lot of responsibility is put on, um, I think, Asian American authors. And then, um, but the truth is like, how many minorities are in positions of power at publishing houses and things like that. You know, I think there's still a lot of work to do in terms of like <laughs> addressing white supremacy um, at that like publisher's level. So we get to see more of these stories, you know, we're out here writing them. Um, let's make sure that they get, they get read, you know. Um, thank you. Thank you all for that. And uh, I want to apologize just because it, it, I'm seeing that we're, we're here at one o'clock already um, and, and won't have a chance to, to answer all of the, the audience questions. Um, uh, thank you um, uh, for asking and, and maybe maybe we can um, we can uh, uh, forward the questions along by email and, and, and um, find find a good way to to deliver them. Um, but um, 
I, I just um, wanted to um, uh, thank, thank you all uh, for being here and um, especially Rachel Reese and, and Kathy um, uh, for, for, um, for being here and for supporting um, uh, Point Reyes books and, um, and, uh, and independent bookstores, uh, generally speaking. Um, I, I have a, um, a message um, um, from Stephen Sparks at, um, at Point Reyes Books. He, he couldn't be here um, because he, he stuck um, without audio and video um, at the store, but, but he says, um, uh, uh, I want to convey our gratitude to these writers and all the folks who donated. It's been a lonely few months as a bookseller with the doors closed, so to feel the sense of community is invigorating. And um, I just, I want to say that um, for those of you who don't have these three books, um, you need to have these books and, and, um, and you should buy them from Point Reyes Books. Um, they, they're they're uh, uh, available online um, and also limited uh, shopping um, uh, in store. So um, uh, this, this is our, our last uh, We Love Bookstores for the moment, but, um, but uh, you should check back on the website, welovebookstores.org. Um, we are um, uh, slowly releasing video from, from our 24, 25 events, um, and also with links to, um, so you can continue to donate and help support the bookstores that, that we've had events uh, for. Um, uh, we've now uh, raised over $62,000 uh, uh, for Bay Area bookstores. Um, thank, thanks so much to all of you uh, for your help and support and, and to the authors, um, of course. Um, thank you. Thank you for helping us here. And, um, and thank you for your work. Um, uh, it, it, it's been really crucial uh, for me uh, during, the, during the pandemic as well. And, and I know for a lot of the folks who are here. Um, uh, I know we could probably talk all day and I, I'd actually love to do that. But um, uh, let's, um, uh, let's, let's hope to see each other in, in, in person um, in the nearest future. And, um, and until then, to see each other here on Zoom. Um, uh, yeah, thank you all for being here and, and for your help and support. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Reese.